Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. My name is Joyce Wetzeltoft, and I'm honored to serve on your Board of Trustees. Today's service is led by our Interim Re Minister, Dr. Reverend, Co <laughs> Reverend Teresa Cooley, I'll get that right, Reverend Keith Cron, soloist Adrian Banuelos, and accompanist Wells Lang. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin the service. There are many ways to connect with our church community throughout the week, <clears throat> both in person and virtually. Whether you're new or ready to find new ways to engage, please visit our website and social media to learn more. Neighborhood Church upholds a covenant of right relations through which we commit to act so that the needs of the individual and the greater faith community can be in harmony. We covenant to honor one another, engage one another, and give to one another and our institution. Here are today's announcements. The Eighth Principal Committee invites you to attend the Quiet Denial Implicit Bias Workshop next Saturday, April 30th, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., conducted by Zuri Alexander, returning to our campus after her highly impactful June 10th, 2018 service on the wealth accumulation gap over the generations. The workshop discussion will be tailored to our own community and experiences. Food and fellowship to follow. Child care is available by request, and please contact Matt Vasco, Matt Vasco if this is needed. Also, very important, save the date of Friday, May the 6th, put it on your calendars now, for our neighborhood church community dinner. Music, food, and fun provided. Time to celebrate our returning um, church and community. And then the real exciting uh, announcement just released is um, hot off the press the search select committee the search committee selection team after receiving and reviewing 18 applications which is great and conducting individual interviews spending numerous hours in personal and group discernment would like to announce the following state of candidates for neighborhoods next search committee Man, I'm w w messing my words today. Next Senior Minister's Search Committee. So these are the members that are being put forward. Mary Fover Holmes, Ben Lopez, Sarah Marcotte, Lynn Miyamoto, Louise Vin Villanueva, Paul Wallace, and Margaret Wilcox. The selection team is excited to bring this terrifically talented and deeply experienced and diverse slate of nominees to the congregation for a vote of approval at the annual meeting on May 22nd. Please watch for the annual report for pictures and bios of these candidates. Thanks again to all who applied, considered applying, or encouraged others to be on the search committee. We were humbled by the generosity and commitment of our congregation, demonstrated by having so many amazing people willing to do that. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. Now we'll hear from Elizabeth Sadlon, who will give us information on the pledge. Thanks, Joyce. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Sadlon, your board president, and I am here with a pledge update. The headline is, we're doing great, but we're not done yet. This church year, which goes through the end of May, is the, is the first time in over 20 years that our pledge payments have come in higher than our pledge promises at the beginning of the year. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for that. Looking ahead to next church year, we're having a terrific pledge drive thanks to new and innovative leadership, fresh messaging, an active Canvas team, and wonderful pulpit testimonials that shared the spirit of giving, whether the speakers were involved with neighborhood for a few months or for several generations. And results are looking strong. 
Pledges are ahead of last year, reversing eight years of decline. Again, huge thanks to all of you for that. <coughs> We're not done yet. We need to hear from another 50 households so we can meet our budget goals as our way of living our values through our budget. Thank you if you have stretched to make the most generous pledge commitment you can for the coming year. If you've been meaning to pledge and haven't, or have questions, any questions about pledging, today's the day to stop by the table after the service. We're asking for a pledged commitment today, which then will be paid in the year that begins June, this June 2022 through May of 2023. So we're doing the promising, the committing right now. If you had a good tax year and can increase your pledge, stop by the table. <laughs> Be part of this pivotal year for our finances, for our interim process, and for our exciting ministerial search. Thank you for being part of the thriving future of this beloved community. It is a busy morning, as you can see outside. We have this wonderful resource fair that has been put together by the pastoral care team, most especially Sue Erie, which features three resources that can be really helpful to all of us. The Young and Healthy organization, whose model is simple. People helping people, collaborating with other com community institutions. Pasadena Village is an intentional community of adults over 55 who support each other while living independently in their homes through a variety of programs. And the Huntington Senior Care Network is an outpatient department of Huntington Hospital that helps older adults, adults with disabilities, and their families remain healthy and independent so please look at all of their resources, play some of the games, pick up some of the snacks, and have a good time after this service. Now Martin Matthews is gonna give a brief announcement. Uh, good morning. My name is Martin Matthews and I am chair of the DeBeneville Pines Summer Camp Committee. My goal this morning is to encourage you to drop by our table on the patio and find out more information about this year's camp. Your enthusiastic presence at last year's Summer Camp at Neighborhood uh, was exciting, but this year we are excited to say we are back in Angeles Oaks in the beautiful San Gorgonio Wilderness uh, at our beloved DeBeneville Pines Camp. <laughs> Our camp this year is August 26th through 28th, the last weekend in August, and outside after church you're going to find information, brochures, friendly people to answer your camp-related questions. We begin taking registrations forms next Sunday, May 1st. For me personally, it was almost 20 years ago when we began tentatively attending neighborhood, enjoying the services and the music, my wife and I knowing few people on the patio afterwards. But for us, it was Camp de Venneville Pines twice a year that dropped us into a kind of whirling dervishness of neighborhood-based friendships that have been there for us all these years and that we cherish each and every day. So check out the table, join the Facebook group, become a camper, talk to some friendly people, and maybe this is your year to uh, join us at camp. Thank you.
Good morning. It is still morning, just a few minutes. We call this part of the service opening words, which could mean simply to open, to begin. But there is also a deeper meaning to this idea of opening. It's not just intended to simply begin the service, but also to do the work of opening. The work of breaking apart the tight hold that we have on who we think we know, who we think we are, what we believe we control, who we expect to become. These words are meant to open, to call us into a time that is special, a time for quiet and contemplation, for slowing down, being still. These words call us into a community that is sacred, that is welcoming and encouraging. These words call us back to the center, the deep place inside us where we find strength in our values. They call us into our hour together, designed to crack open our minds and hearts, to let the light shine through to illuminate what has been growing and strengthening in the fertile dark. So let us step into this opening together. Morning, so fair to see. Welcome, glad you're here, glad you all are here. This is my friend, Penelope. She's the star of the story. The story I'm gonna share with you this morning is, we don't eat our classmates. 
It's by Ryan Higgins. Would not be surprised if he is a Unitarian Universalist somewhere. Penelope Rex was nervous. It's not every day a little T-Rex starts school. What are my classmates going to be like? Will they be nice? How many teeth will they have? <laughs> These questions were all very important to Penelope. Penelope's mom bought her a new backpack with ponies on it. Pony, ponies were Penelope's favorite because ponies are delicious. <laughs> Penelope's dad packed her a lunch of 300 tuna fish sandwiches and one box of apple juice. Finally, the big day came and Penelope Rex was surprised to find out that all of her classmates were children. So she ate them. Because children are delicious. Penelope Rex, said Mrs. Noodleman, we don't eat our classmates. Please spit them out at once. So she did. It was not the best way to start school. Still, Penelope was determined to have a very good first day. She tried hard to make friends at recess, but standing at the bottom of the slide, with her mouth open didn't help. <laughs> she finger painted some of her best work, but her finger paint of the dinosaur eating the child didn't help either. She even saved Griffin Emery a seat at lunch. You can sit here, she said. He didn't. Penelope started to notice that everyone was making friends but her. And it was lonely. When she got home, her dad asked her about her first day of school. I didn't make any friends, Penelope cried. None of the children wanted to play with me. Penelope Rex, her father asked, did you eat your classmates? Well, maybe sort of, just a little bit, she said. Well, sometimes it's hard to make friends, her father said, especially if you eat them. You see, Penelope, children are just the same as us on the inside, just tastier. That gave Penelope a lot to think about. The next day, Penelope tried really hard, but poor Penelope. She couldn't stop herself from eating her classmates. Mrs. Noodleman, Penelope ate William Amoto again. <laughs> and they were all afraid of her. Except for Walter. Walter was the goldfish. So Penelope tried to make friends with him. Will you be my friend, she asked. And she stuck her finger into the bowl and Walter went Chomp! <laughs> and bit her finger. Eee! cried Penelope. He's eating my finger. <laughs> but once Penelope found out what it was like to be someone's snack, she lost her appetite for children. She stopped eating her classmates, even when Cece Woodman spilled barbecue sauce all over herself. <laughs> And soon Penelope began to make friends. They played hide and seek, found you. She made brownies, want a brownie? I helped make them. And now, even when children look especially delicious, she peeks at Walter and remembers what it's like when someone tries to eat you. And Walter the goldfish stares right back at her, and he licks 
his lips. <laughs> because dinosaurs are delicious. <laughs> Something for us to remember as we come back together and start meeting new people. <laughs> How do we get along with each other? And now let's sing the children out to their classes. I'm Joyce Wetzeltoft, and I wanted to just share with you, as you know, each Sunday, our congregation expands our impact by dedicating our 100% of our contributions during the offertory to local social justice efforts. This week, we have selected the Cancer Support Community Pasadena as our recipient. CSC CSCP was formed out of the wellness community. During its 31 year plus years, tens of thousands of people facing the challenges of cancer and their loved ones have been served by participating in various support groups, educational workshops, exercise, nutrition classes, art, writing, social events, and more. And all are offered for free. So I would like to introduce Ms. Vicki Ladig who serves as the secretary of the board of uh, CSCP to tell you more about this amazing organization. And uh, e she will also be available after the service to talk with people and share her, her uh, organization with you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Joyce, and thank all of you here today for inviting me to tell you about the cancer support community and the wonderful work we do for our community here in Pasadena. We are so grateful to be the recipient of your Share the Plate program as we rely on donations and grants and various fundraising efforts to be able to continue to serve the community and offer our services for free. The services we provide to people going through cancer treatment and also their caregivers, their loved ones, and children. And this is my story. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in the summer of 2001. I was totally in shock. I never expected it to happen to me. And after about a year and a half of treatments, I had a lumpectomy, a bilateral mastectomy, chemotherapy, and a number of other operations and procedures, I was physically and emotionally worn out. I was fuzzy-brained and unprepared for the accumulative effects of my treatments. My body and my life had changed, and I wasn't springing back into the, the swing of things like you do when you're a kid. You're sick one day, the next day you're out swinging on the monkey bars. But this was different. I was having a really tough time. And I saw a flyer in a doctor's office advertising a program for breast cancer survivors that was offered by the cancer support community, and it sounded exactly like what I need. So I called up, I enrolled, and the program was held over 10 weeks for two hours on two evenings a week, 
and brought me together with nine other women who had just completed their breast cancer treatments. We ranged in age from 25 to 75 and came from very different backgrounds, but we quickly bonded and shared a lively sense of humor. We lifted each other's spirits by learning that we shared many similar feelings, our fears, frustrations, and uncomfortable physical changes. And each week we had an hour of yoga, an hour of strength training, and we had numerous speakers who gave us information about a lot of, of things we needed to deal with. And we had lots of time to talk about our feelings as a group. And we went from being quietly angry or sad to feeling positively empowered by knowledge and friendship. This is a powerful benefit of the cancer support community. It gave us the venue to build a support group of women who had individually gone through something similar, but who had felt alone and fearful. And it brought us together to heal each other emotionally and discover a true sense of sisterhood. Intellectually, the program helped educate me to make better decisions for my health. Physically, it helped me regain strength and energy from the strength training and yoga. And emotionally, it helped me feel less stressed by learning that I was not alone. It gave me hope and it helped me focus my energy on moving forward more constructively with my life. And our group bonded so well that we still keep in touch today. Before COVID, we would meet about every other month for lunch, but during COVID, we just kept in touch through email and the phones and whatnot. And we continue to support each other's lives. And we're all still alive. So this, what our program offers is, was a microcosm of what we offer at the cancer support community. You just need to go, um, go to their orientation session for, us for an hour to start. And we offer all kinds of different things. We, we have our calendars outside on a table. These, this is what's going on now. It lists the, the different offerings of the educational programs and the um, physical fitness. We've got yoga, we've got strength training, we have all kinds of things. And then if you open it up, it gives you a list of all the things that are offered each day. And I also have a, a list out there of the different um, services we provide. The emotional support groups are critical to people going through um, their treatment and also for their caregivers. The caregivers are always the unsung heroes who don't get credit and can't be cranky and this gives them a place to go and commiserate with each other. Um, and they're all led by a licensed um, therapist. So this is outside too. And then for those of you who are not going through cancer treatment or don't know anybody right now, this is a fabulous little brochure called How to Be a Good Friend to Someone with Cancer. And it gives you some rules of thumbs, of thumb on what to say and what not to say to people going through cancer. I know it, it's, it helps so many people out because you're never quite sure what you should say or how to behave. And I remember when I was diagnosed, I felt like I don't want people to feel like they can't just talk to me openly. So I tried to encourage them to do that. And then I encourage you all to take one of these brochures. If you, if you can't use it right now, I'm sure you have a friend that can. And on the background, it's got our, on the back of it, it's got our information for our contact. So um, thank you again for, for um, honoring us with the, your program. And I just wanna say that we provide support 
and our main focus is that no one faces cancer alone. Thank you. Hello. Um, this first anthem is by Mexican composer uh, Manuel Maria Ponce, who was born in 1882 and died in 1948. Uh, one of the things he's most known for and one of his goals as a composer was to keep the folk songs of the indigenous people alive by arranging them. And so he did that and uh, sadly he died not so rich, kind of poor, um, even though the song I'm about to sing is one his most popular, um, even at the time he was alive. And it's because they thought it was one of those folk songs that he had arranged. Um, but he actually wrote the text and the music for it. And it's called Estrellita. And I'm going to read you a quick, quick translation. It's called um, Estrellita means little star. Little star from the far heaven, you look at my pain. You know how I suffer. Come down and tell me if they still love me a little because I cannot, without their love, continue living. You are, O oh star, my guiding light of love. You know, how, you know that soon I have to die. Come down and tell me if they still love me a little, because I cannot, without their love, continue living. Let us enter into a spirit of prayer and meditation. The title for these meditation words is Unclenching. 
It was nearly a perfect day for a walk. I wasn't alone. My favorite sighting was a woman walking her adorable French bulldog down the street. I heard good boy Luke several times as she pulled slightly on the leash to keep Luke from being too distracted. Around the corner comes a man with a pit bull. Luke immediately goes stock still. But the pit bull is wagging her tail with the greatest of hope and charm, clearly excited about the possibility of making and meeting a new friend. She certainly won me over. The woman tries to get Luke to move forward in vain because he is being a statue. Eventually, the man with the pit bull comes closer to the woman and her dog. And if possible, Luke gets even stiffer. The woman is trying to tell Luke that it's going to be OK. And the pit bull hit, sniffs hopefully and inquisitively at her new wished for friend. And then, in an instant, Luke relaxes and sniffs back. And quickly, their tails are wagging as they sniff and nuzzle and snort. And I notice the owners have relaxed, that they too have unclenched. And they are now talking amiably. Though near as I can tell, their tails are not a-wagging with the same veracity as their pets. It's only then that I realize that I have been clenching, clenching and now feel my body relax. I left the happy foursome and headed off, thinking how much of a metaphor this was for today's times, how we all seem to be living lives of trepidation and fear, and yet hope and kindness is out there if we look beyond the stereotypes, if we present ourselves with kindness, if we just try. I think about the reputation that pet bulls have, and yet she was the kindest of all. Maybe in these trying and difficult times, we need to have a little more, we need to be a little bit more like the pit bull in whatever ways we can, offering a little hope and kindness to all those new friends we might make. And the text goes like this. It's a conversation between an adult and a, and a kid. The kid says, who's the guy on the glass? A mug. There's a picture of a person. Um, the adult says, that's Joyce. Joyce, says the kid, that's a girl's name. The adult says, that's a name. The kid says, well, what's with him? The adult says, he watches over me. And then the kid says, he's only got one eye. And the adult says, a guy like him, that's all he needs.
watches over me is only God one eye. A guy like him, that's all he The reading this morning, morning is from Emily Bernard. It's from her book, Black is the Body. Emily was a graduate student at Yale over 25 years ago. She was in a coffee shop one night when a young man with mental health issues walked into the coffee shop and began stabbing people randomly. She was one of the people's stabbed. This is the story she tells of the harm that happened to her that night. I did experience terrible pain on the night of August 7th. The person responsible for it was the surgeon on call. I lay on a gurney feeling helpless and afraid. The surgeon walked over without saying a word to me or even looking in my direction. He plunged his fingers into my gaping wound. I gasped and I instinctively grasped his hand. It was only then that the man looked at me and he said icily, don't touch my hand. His eyes were airy and blue and as cold as his voice. I asked questions about what was happening to me and he refused to respond. Only the attending nurses treated me with any kindness and respect. Whenever I now tell the story of the night that I got stabbed, I always say the person who did the most harm to me, who left the deepest wounds, was not Daniel Silva, the young man with mental health issues, but it was, in fact, the surgeon on call. Great hymnal. Number 88, Come Soul of All Things. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you. I'm the Reverend Keith Crum. I work for the UUA. I live in Providence, Rhode Island. For the last 12, almost 13 years, I have directed the Office of Ministerial Transitions. 
Grateful to meet with leaders yesterday to do the work of the Beyond Categorical Thinking Workshop as you get ready for your settled ministerial search process. Great to be with my longtime friend, Teresa, who I've known for now over 30 years. Um, great to be back out in a congregation meeting in person. It is so good to be with you all. I have been thinking a lot in my role and in general about the future of religion. What is it that might lie ahead? And I really started thinking about this a couple of years ago. You may remember a couple of events that happened in the city of Pittsburgh. You may remember when a man walked in and began opening fire in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, killing many members. And you may also remember not long before that, in Pittsburgh, it was announced, finally told the stories of sexual abuse by the Roman Catholic Church in the city of Pittsburgh. And thinking about those two stories and all that has happened in religion, it has made me wonder, why does anyone trust religion at all? What is its purpose? But then I think of our own Robert Fulgham, Unitarian Universalist minister who once wrote, to be human is to be religious. To be religious is to be mindful. To be mindful is to pay attention. And to pay attention is to sanctify existence. We just naturally live with religious questions. And where will we go to have those explored and wonder about. I think about all of that. I think about as we think about these religious questions. And I think about the fact that one of the things I do is I train people to be interim ministers. And over the last seven, several years, I've asked these new ministers to think about what is it a congregation really needs from a minister and ministry these days? The answers are uh, what you would expect good preaching, pastoral care, someone who can be prophetic, a promoter of congregational life. But what really intrigues me is what has not been said in those gatherings. Not one person said what we really need to do as religion is to build trust with each other. We really need to be a space where we live into living out the value of doing no harm. See, I was curious about ministers not mentioning that, but it occurs to me, and now in my 12 years of doing this work, I've never had a congregation say, this is what we need from a minister. Someone who will build trust. Someone who will help us figure out how to do no harm, and that they do no harm. So I've been thinking about how do we build and rebuild trust in religion. How do we show up for each other, particularly when the world doesn't go as we think about, and how do we show up in the wider world? And I reflect on one of the first experiences I had when I had at the UUA the job before this, when I was the director of the Office of Bisexual, Gay, Lesbian, and Transgender Concerns, and had been called by our congregation in Laramie, Wyoming, just after Matthew Shepard was killed. And the minister said, we just simply need someone to be here with us. We have no idea what this means and what goes ahead. So I flew to Wyoming. And in talking to the minister, he and I agreed that that Sunday morning, I asked, what, what is it you would like me to talk about? And he said, I just want you to say a few words. I got this really nice letter of support from someone which I would like to read, and then I'd just like for you to say a few words. And I agreed, and then later we'll go to the fence where Matthew had been left. So the minister stood up, read the letter, turned to me, and now said, and now Reverend Cron will lead the sermon <laughs> this morning. <laughs> I don't remember what I said. I do remember how important it felt to just simply be there and be with people as we were trying to figure all of this out. Later, when we went to the fence where Matthew had been 
left to die and died, uh, we had agreed we were going to lay some flowers down. So the minister took a bouquet of flowers, put them by the fence, turned to me and said, and now Reverend Cron will lead the memorial service <laughs> for Matthew Shepard. I have no idea what I said. I do remember standing with the people of the congregation by the fence where a man had died just simply four days before. And how important it was that we could just simply be there together, trying to make sense of the unimaginable. And it reminded me, it was, it was just in the next year when I'd been invited to guest preach at our congregation in Littleton, Colorado, Columbine UU Church. I showed up there two weeks after the shooting at Columbine High School, and I showed up there and saw one of the most amazing acts that I have seen in Unitarian Universalism, because I walked into that sanctuary this morning, and on the wall were letters and pictures done by Unitarian Universalists, adults and children, offering support to this congregation, the church closest to Columbine High School, where the minister had, at our congregation there had known the parents of the shooters, just offering support, just being there for each other. And it made me think one of the things we do, do need to do for each other now is just simply show up. And I'm grateful now that we are able to do this now in person again. But it's also, as I think about things like trust, I'm reminded that Brene Brown talks about how um, trust is built in little moments. And that has made me think, is it broken in little moments? And certainly as I had a conversation with a minister in Laramie about that, I told him you had surprised me. And he said, I literally had no idea what to do. This is beyond what I had thought I would ever do as a minister. And I said, this moment is beyond what any of us thought. But we can show up for each other. We can talk to each other. But just be real about what we need. And then we figure it out. And it also made me think of a story about trust being built in the little moments, how harm happens. And I remember back to seminary, I was in a class on death and dying, was taught by a woman who was a Holocaust survivor. She was a therapist who worked with teens and youth who had been contemplating suicide. And she asked us one day to role play what it would be like to be a chaplain at the bedside of a man near his death, couldn't move, could barely speak, what we do as a chaplain in that impossible moment. So someone volunteered to be the patient, someone volunteered to be the chaplain. The person who was the chaplain went over to the patient, sat down next to him and took his hand. At which point, Anna stood up and said, please never do that again. And we all stopped surprised and looked at Anna. And she said, I want you to think about this person in this bed. Here is a person near the end of his life. He cannot move. He is in control of nothing. And you took his hand. You touched him without asking him if you could do that first. You continued to take away control and remind him that he had no control of his life. What would have happened if you had simply given him the opportunity to have just even a little bit of control by answering yes or no to you. Think about that story pretty much every day in ministry. How do we show up and not do more harm? How do we do it for each other? I think about what happens in our congregations. Trace and I have a good friend who just retired from the UUA a couple years ago. He happened to be in Cleveland visiting his son. He was taking his son and two of his son's friends, all of whom were in their 20s, to a baseball game. On the way to the baseball game, they drove by a Unitarian Universalist congregation. 
And the three 20-year-olds saw the church building and they saw on the outside of it a Black Lives Matter banner and a huge rainbow flag. Immediately, the three young men began talking about how if they were going to go to a church, this is the church they would want to go to. These were the values they wanted to espouse. And I think about them and wonder, what would happen if they actually did, or if they did actually show in this church? I'm sure they would be welcomed. I'm sure they would be told, I'm glad you're here. But what would the expectations be? Could they show up and be themselves? Or would, as I've seen all too often, be told on one level, you are welcome here with the unspoken expectation, you are welcome here as long as you act like the 60 and 70 year olds who are already here in our congregation. <laughs> as long as you pledge like the 60 and 70 year olds who are already here in our congregation. As long as you join six or seven committees like the 60 or 70 year olds who are already here who are part of our congregation. What would it mean to let them just show up and be who they are and to seek their own questions and to figure out how to live their own values? They want to, to want to make a difference. It's why they showed up. Will we let them? We often do this same thing for uh, our ministers of color, for our black, indigenous, uh, people of color ministers. You are welcome here as long as you act like us, as long as you think like us. And as we talked about yesterday in the workshop, there are little things that happen which we don't think about. And I want to tell you a story of a big thing that you would not think would happen, but it did. A friend of mine, African-American minister colleague, showed up in a congregation to preach, showed up in a suit with a folder, with his sermon, walked into the church sanctuary. The greeter looked up at him and, and said with a smile, are you here to clean the building this morning? can tell you in 450 of the congregations I visited across the US and Canada, no one has ever asked me if I was there to clean. What are the assumptions we make and how do we not have them? We also see this around theology. How do we not eat our classmates? <laughs> Sometimes we can be as rigid and as, and, and as Harmful as some of the fundamentalists many of us have tried to escape. It's really good to be a place where people of many theologies can show up. It could be a golden age for Unitarian Universalism. As we move out of this phase of the pandemic, there will be people who will be looking for community, trying to get answers that not one set of beliefs can find, looking for a place that isn't fighting about gay rights or trans rights where the younger folks who know diversity because they live it are looking for a church that actually looks like the world they in, live with. Will that be our congregations? Or will we simply decide, no, no, we have to be like we always were. We have to get back to the way we were. And I now ask congregations in search, is what you really want as a minister? Or is what you really want a hospice chaplain? because the number of people who want what you have had before is getting smaller and smaller. And yet Unitarian Universalism is needed now more than ever. Think about the Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie who writes about the danger of the single story. She says, the single story creates stereotypes and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue but they are incomplete. They make one story the only story. Each of you is more than a single story. Each of you congregation is more than a single story. How do we figure out how to live these multiple stories into existence? This is what the world needs at the moment. Will we allow ourselves to be more than a single story? Or will we commit little acts of violence, do more harm, and expect everyone to be the way we were? How do we in these times, how do we unclench? How do we do no harm? 
How do we pay attention? How do we sanctify existence? How are we going to be religious? That's not to say there won't be disagreements. I think about the dean of my seminary who told me this story. He was meeting with deans from eight other seminaries, and he and one of the other deans from the Lutheran school had very different opinions about what should happen next. And what Bob said what him, intrigued him the most was that the other seven deans were spending their time trying to get the two of them to get along. <laughs> and he finally said, I want you to know that Jeff and I disagree. After this meeting, we'll probably go to lunch. We will continue to be friends. We will make a decision and we will move on. I'm more interested in knowing what you believe then you are trying to make this better. If you want to take it better, I would like to hear your voices and your opinions. Can we really let the diversity of what we believe be side by side next to each other? I so hope we can. I really learned this many years ago. I just started at the UUA, was at a conference on religion, gender, and sexuality. I was there as a representative, among representatives from some 40 denominations, some conservative, some middle of the road, some liberal. On the opening day, I looked at the panel where I was sitting, all 40 of us in this huge auditorium. Sitting next to me was John from the Church of God and Mark from the Church of Christ. The microphone is passed around, it finally gets to John, and he says, Hi, my name is John, I'm from the Church of God, and we are to the right of the right. <laughs> he smiles and hands the microphone to me. And I go, Hi, my name is the Reverend Keith Cron, I'm the Director of the Office of Bisexual, Gay, Lesbian, and Transgender Concerns, at which point I have to stop talking because John and Mark are scooting their chairs away from me. <laughs> I said, and I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister, and we are to the left of the left. <laughs> I then had to toss the Mac microphone to Mark, who wouldn't take it from me. We spent the next four days talking about all things about religion, gender, and sexuality. I watched amazed faces as I talked about how Unitarian Universalism had more women in ministry than men, how we not only were accepting but welcomed ministers who were gay, lesbian, bisexual, and or transgender. There were appalled faces from John and Mark and others as I talked about how we did comprehensive and full sexuality education for our middle schoolers and have been doing that since 1971. It was a very fascinating four days. And on the last day, John and Mark and two of his friends, probably named Matthew and Lou, <laughs> came up to me and said, we would like to have lunch with you. And I thought, this will be fun. <laughs> but I had learned all five of us were all from Tennessee originally. And I thought, at least we have that in common. So we all sat down. Uh, we talked about uh, being from Tennessee for a moment before Mark finally said to me, we just wanted you to know that we have listened to every word you said, and we have disagreed with every single word you have said for the last four days. But we wanted you to know that we respect you, because at least you are clear about what you believe. And that's something that we value in our faith, that clarity. They were my teachers in that moment, a reminder that people of very different beliefs can be together and be <coughs> respectful. One of them then tentatively asked me if I knew anything about football, and it only took them a short while to realize that, I, that they that they realized that I knew more about football than all four of them combined. <laughs> so I got to be their 
teacher in that moment. We all got to be more than a single story with each other. And this is my hope for us, that we can just celebrate the multiple stories that each of us and each congregation has as we move forth, that we can be a place where people can show up and ask their questions, be a place that builds trust, works to do no harm, honors what is here, that we can be a place of clarity without being rigid, and be a place where we can all be classmates together, where we can sanctify existence, that we can work to do no harm in a world where a lot of harm happens. That is my hope for the future of religion. I hope that's something that we as Unitarian Universalists can move forward to. And I will work with you as you work in your next ministerial search to find a minister who can help you do that. Maya Angelou once said, people will forget what you did, people will forget what you said, <coughs> but people will never forget how you made them feel. May we work toward a world we remember our impact on each other. Go in peace, go in love, work for justice, Go forth and bless the world. Amen.